Today's sermon is brought to us by Pastor Mike Moses. We hope that you are uplifted and encouraged by this wonderful sermon. Well, I would invite you to turn with me this morning to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And we'll be focusing on chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. And a message called The Joy of Contentment. Originally, this was going to be the last sermon in the Philippians series. I was going to try to go all the way to the end of chapter 4. And as I was preparing this week, I thought there is no way that I can cover all of the riches of all of these verses in just one week. So this will be our second to last message in Philippians as we cover chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. Father, we pray that you will minister to us today, even as our minds are focused upon your word. I pray that you would cause our hearts to be submissive to your word today. As we consider what the scriptures have to say about this all-important topic of contentment and not a contentment that can be found in ourselves, not a contentment that can be found in any sort of philosophy or theology of the world, but a contentment that can only be found in you. So Lord, train our minds upon your words, even as our hearts are submitted to you, and do the work in our hearts and lives that only you can do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been following this series with us from the beginning, you understand that Paul was writing these words of Philippians from a prison in Rome. He had been placed there due to his faithfulness in preaching the word of God. As he was in prison in Rome, he wrote this letter back to a church 800 miles away in the city of Philippi, a letter which was in part a thank you note for a financial gift that they had sent. If someone sends you a gift, you certainly should be very appreciative of it, and it's a nice thing to send a thank you note. And here at the end of this letter, Paul does just that. He attaches, as it were, a thank you note to the end of this letter. And we're going to consider a portion of that thank you note today, and we'll finish it next week. Notice with me, if you would, Philippians 4, beginning at verse 10. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. I have to confess to you that as we begin this message on contentment, that the issue of contentment is still very much a work in progress within my own heart. And perhaps nowhere does my discontentment come forth more than when it comes to my relationship with the weather. (laughs) Now, we really are blessed here in this state to be able to experience all four seasons of the year, summer, fall, winter, and spring. The problem with me, though, is that often when I am in the midst of a season, I am taking for granted the good things about that season and only thinking about the negatives. Just a few months ago, I was freezing cold and I was thinking if only summer would come, if only June would arrive and we would have those nice, warm, sunny days. And now June is here and I'm thinking, where did all these bugs come from? I forgot about summer bugs. Ugh. Now, this coming week, I've seen a forecast that's supposed to be close to 100 degrees this Wednesday and I'm going to be tempted to complain and be discontent with that heat that I wanted just a few months ago. And my mind starts looking toward the fall and thinking, you know, I kind of like jackets. I kind of like hoodies. Not a fan of pumpkin spice lattes, but I like apple cider. 
And, and I'm kind of looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to Christmas lights and the holiday season. But you know what's going to happen when that time comes. All I'm going to be doing is thinking I'm freezing cold. And will it ever stop snowing? I'm so tired of shoveling my driveway. And even on one of those perfect days in, in spring or early fall, when it's sunny, sunny, maybe just partly cloudy, 72 degrees, and it's an absolutely perfect day, I can be outside thinking, why in the world don't I live in a place where it's like this every day of the year? I would guess I'm not the only one that struggles with, with contentment. Contentment is a, a human problem. If we have, we complain, or I'm sorry, if we don't have, we complain. If we do have, we complain that we don't have more or that we don't have better. And yet, as we grow in Christ, the Lord does something in our hearts to produce a deep and steady joy, the kind of joy that results in contentment, a contentment which encompasses any circumstance. And this is point number one today, the scope of contentment which covers any circumstance. That's the focus of verses 12, 10 through 12. You know, there is an unavoidable fact of life that you must reckon with, and that is that circumstances will change. Inevitably, as you go through life, circumstances will change. Wouldn't you like to be the kind of person who maintains a steadiness of heart and mind no matter what comes? I want to be that kind of person. Notice again verse 10 as Paul leads into his teaching on contentment. He addresses this gift that has been sent by the Philippians. And in verse 10, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Paul had a 10 or 12 year relationship with this church in Philippi. He had brought the gospel to that city over a decade before and immediately the church began supporting Paul and his missionary endeavors. But in subsequent years, although the Philippian church continued to care very much about the apostle Paul, they did not have opportunity. There was not a need to express their support for him in a financial way. But when they heard that he was in prison in Rome, that was the opportunity to show the care that they had for him all along. I'm sure that you have a number of friends in your life that you care about deeply, but perhaps they are just not in a place where they need a tangible expression of your care through tangible support. But if that person ends up sick, if that person ends up in the hospital, if that person ends up in unexpected need, that becomes the opportunity to express the care that you have had for them all along. And this was the situation with the Philippians' gift to Paul. And Paul makes it clear in thanking the Philippians that the gift was very much appreciated. He rejoiced when it arrived. But Paul is very wise in the way that he thanks the Philippians. He is very careful not to thank them in such a way that would make it seem as if he was motivated by money primarily in his ministry. And he is also careful to thank them and not in a way that would make it seem as if he were dependent upon such financial gifts for his joy. And he goes on in verse 11 to make this very clear. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Paul had learned to be content in any situation, regardless of what he had or didn't have. And this maturity of contentment is something that every Christian must intentionally be learning because discontentment, although it is a sin, is never a stand-alone sin. Discontentment serves as a gateway sin into many other sins. 
Last year, I read a book by a Puritan writer from a few centuries ago named Thomas Watson, a small book called The Art of Divine Contentment. Well-known quote from that book, Thomas Watson wrote this, Satan loves to fish in the waters of a discontented heart. Satan loves to fish in the waters of a discontented heart. Why is that? Because a discontented heart is a pond stocked with other sins. Think of all the sins that discontentment leads to. Discontentment leads to impatience. Discontentment leads to ingratitude. So often, discontentment leads to sexual immorality or gluttony or substance abuse. Discontentment in your relationships can lead to envy and jealousy. Discontentment can even lead to a resentment and a bitterness against the Lord. Discontentment never remains alone, but always recruits some other sins to come along. And this is why it was so very important that Paul had learned contentment, that we learn contentment, the kind of contentment that is not altered by the circumstances in life that will inevitably change. Notice verse 12, Paul says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. This is the scope of Christian contentment any circumstance, every circumstance, whether you're brought low or whether you abound. This past Friday, I had just finished uh, the final touches on my sermon preparation, and I I headed home for the evening. We were going to be hosting some people at our house on Friday evening, and so I I went home to help my wife finish preparations uh, for the house, and and, uh, I was all ready to host our friends, and I went downstairs to the laundry room uh, to retrieve something from there, and when I opened the laundry room door, I was hit with a smell that was just unbelievable. It it was the stench of a thousand outhouses. (laughs) And and as my eyes took in what was going on in the laundry room, my poor dog, had he had apparently eaten something that he shouldn't have eaten and got as sick as I have ever seen him get sick. And the evidence was all over the laundry room floor. And I do mean all over. You've heard the phrase, sick as a dog. (laughs) I I think I now understand that phrase. And yes, the, the words of Scripture are true. A dog does return to his vomit. It was a terrible, terrible situation. So here I am, about to open up my house to some guests in a scramble to get all of the final preparations in place, having just prepared a sermon on being content in any and every circumstance. And it was almost like the Holy Spirit was saying, you're about to preach this. Do you really mean it? And so I I bit my tongue and tried to quiet my anxious heart and rolled up my sleeves and got to work. Now, there are far worse situations than what I've just described. Certainly, Paul knew how to be brought very, very, very low. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he lists out a resume of suffering, the terrible things that he had endured in service to the Lord. He describes many laborers, many imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. 
Five times he received 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. A night and a day he was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from his own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleep sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. He knew what it was to be brought low. But the truth is, as difficult as it is to be content when you have very little, spiritually speaking, it can be just as difficult to navigate having much. Because even as you enjoy abundance, even as you face plenty, even as you are abounding, is your heart in a place of contentment where you could let it go? Think back to Paul's first experience with the Philippians as he entered that city with the gospel and many hearts were opened to receive the gospel. One of the first converts was a woman named Lydia, who we understand to be a very successful merchant, a seller of purple. And no doubt as that fledgling church was started, Lydia and perhaps others who had some resources would put on banquets in their home whereby they could come together and fellowship in Christ and celebrate the gospel. And so you can imagine Paul and his team enjoying these sumptuous banquets of food in the house of Lydia. And yet what happens? One day unexpectedly as he is casting a demon out of a slave girl, he is thrown in prison. A feast at breakfast and and a prison cell at midnight. And yet his heart is in a place of contentment in prison where he sings songs of praise. He knew how to be abound and then to be brought low. Most people don't aim to be downwardly mobile, but a heart of contentment knows how to face abundance and need. And of course, in this, Paul was following the example of Jesus, who dwelt from eternity past in the throne room of heaven. And yet, as Paul has reminded us in chapter 2, he was willing to step away from that abundance and to be brought low, to lower himself to a manger, to a life as a servant. He was willing to go hungry rather than give in to Satan's temptation. He lived as a nomad with nowhere to lay his head. And then he was brought low all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so Paul was simply following the example of Christ. And he was learning to be content regardless of what he had or didn't have. But this is something that we need to be intentional in learning because contentment does not come naturally to the human soul. We need to enroll in the school of contentment and learn it because if we're not intentional in this way, whatever circumstance we are in, we will find something to complain about. If you have a lot of stuff, you may stress about it getting broken or lost or stolen. If you don't have a lot of stuff, you may feel you're missing out upon the joy that those things could provide. If you have too many friends, you may be overwhelmed by social commitments. If you don't have enough friends, you may feel lonely and overlooked. If you're looked up to, you may be overcome by pride. If you're looked down on, you may be overcome by shame. And even if you feel that you've reached the perfect balance of stuff and friends and status, you may stress about that tedious balance being upended by some unexpected situation. See, the problem of discontentment has nothing to do with what you have or don't have. It has everything to do with your heart. Have we truly learned what it means to walk by faith? Again, I quote Thomas Watson. He says, to see a Christian 
dejected by the lack of visible supplies and support. Where is faith in this? Oh, says someone, my estate in the world is down. Yes, and even worse, Watson says, your faith is down. You say, oh, Pastor Mike, I I need to learn contentment. This is a problem for me. So how do I enroll in the school of contentment? How is it that I can discover what Paul describes in verse 12? How do I discover the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need? If it's a secret, where can I find it? Now, this is almost humorous to me because Paul says, I've got a secret in verse 12. And if he were a really clever marketer, here he would have said, and you can find out the secret by buying my new book, available on Amazon for $12.99. Or, or you, can, you can discover the secret of contentment by enrolling for my seven-step program of contentment. But he doesn't do this. It's almost hilarious. He says, I've got a secret. And then in the very next verse, he tells the secret. He was just one of those people who couldn't keep a secret. He just goes, comes right out with it. I've got a secret to contentment, and here's what it is. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The worst kept secret ever. And this is number two today, the secret of contentment, Christ's strength. I can do all things, particularly I can be content in all circumstances through Christ who strengthens me. Now, this is an oft-quoted verse and oft-quoted out of context. I have had a number of Christian friends who were the athletic type who took this to be their life verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And perhaps they write Philippians 4.13 on their basketball shoe or the underside of their baseball cap or on their hockey stick or whatever it may be. Perhaps a Christian power lifter would have this tattooed on his biceps so that as he goes for that personal record lift, he may glance over and be encouraged in the fact that I can lift this weight through Christ who strengthens me. And and I don't want to be too hard on someone, by the way, who keeps this verse near them. There are far worse things that you could have tattooed on your bicep. (laughs) But, But let us not forget about the context. What Paul is saying is that I can be content in any and every circumstance through him who strengthens me. And of course, we understand the hymn there to be a reference to Christ. All throughout this book, Paul has emphasized to us the importance of being in Christ. 51 times we find that phrase, in Christ, throughout this short letter. Paul said, I want to be found in him. I want to know him. I want to press on in him. His entire being was rooted and grounded in Christ. And as you are in that place of being in Christ with the totality of your being, you find in that strength for each moment, including the strength that you need to be content. Because contentment is not easy. Even someone as mature and holy as the Apostle Paul did not have it within his own resources to be content. Nor do you, nor do I. We need the strength of Christ for this. And this is where the contentment that Paul is describing is a uniquely Christian contentment. It's different, perhaps, from some other forms of contentment that you have heard of. Even in Paul's day, there was a philosophical line of thinking called Stoicism, which endorsed a version of contentment that was self-sufficient. The Stoic line went like this. We should be sufficient unto ourselves for all things and able by the power of our wills to resist the force of circumstances. 
But Paul is not commending to us a self-sufficient contentment. He is commending to us a contentment that depends on the sufficiency of Christ, the strength that comes from Christ alone as we turn our anxieties toward prayer, as we turn our minds upon what is good and beautiful and true. We find in Christ the strength to endure through seasons whereby we may be strongly tempted to be discontent. We learn to draw near to the God of all grace who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and who promises to provide everything we need. It's not a stoic kind of contentment, nor is it a Buddhist kind of contentment. There is a version of contentment commended by some Eastern religions, primarily Buddhism, which is all about desiring less. They would say something to the effect of, do you know how it is you can have everything you want? Want fewer things. Now, there may be some practical wisdom in that to a certain extent, but Christian contentment is not actually about desiring less. It is about desiring better I want to make sure this is very clear to us. Contentment is not about desiring less. It is about desiring better. It is about desiring the glorious riches of knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's about finding our joy in eternal realities that cannot be touched by the circumstances of life. Christ is mine forevermore. Mine are keys to Zion City. Don't desire less, desire better. But even this is not easy. Even as we remind ourselves of the riches in Christ, this is not a contentment that we can muster up on our own strength. It is only one that will come about as we are deeply rooted in the Lord. I want to invite you to hold your place in Philippians 4 and turn back to 1 Samuel with me. The book of 1 Samuel found in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel, it comes right before 2 Samuel, as you might have guessed. 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'll give you a moment to turn there. The book of 1 Samuel tells the story of David before David was made king as he was waiting on the Lord for the opportunity to be anointed as king of Israel. And at this time in the story of David, 1 Samuel 30, David along with his men and their families were living in a city called Ziklag. Now, they had just gone on a mission, David and his men, to another town, and as they returned to Ziklag, 1 Samuel 30, verse 1 tells us that they returned to a terrible situation, absolute worst-case scenario. 1 Samuel 30, verse 1, Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they had taken captive the women and all who were in the city, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with them, imagine this, put yourself in their shoes. David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. Absolute worst case scenario. The city was burned, wives and children captured, and then it got worse. Because David's men started looking at him as the leader and wanted to blame him for what they felt was a leadership failure and they wanted to kill him. Notice what verse 6 says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters." When we talk about any and every circumstance, this is as bad as it gets. But notice how verse 6 ends. But David 
strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself, but not according to his own internal resources. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I want to invite you to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians now, back in the New Testament, just a a short distance before the book of Philippians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we see an example of Paul learning what it is he commends to the Philippians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Many of you are familiar with this story. It's the incident where Paul prays for a thorn in his flesh to be removed. A terribly difficult situation. A messenger of Satan sent to torment him. And lest we think, again, that Paul was endorsing some sort of Buddhist version of contentment, some sort of nirvana that was just above it all, we see that this is not the case. He begged with the Lord to take this thorn away. He felt it deeply and it hurt. Notice the Lord's response in verse 9. He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And notice verse 10, For the sake of Christ then I am, what's the word? I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Strong in the power of Christ. Strong in the strength that only Christ can give. This is the secret. As we turn back to Philippians chapter 4, As Paul continues into verse 14, he indicates to us uh, something that would clear up perhaps a misconception about Christian contentment. Christian contentment does not renounce all material resources. In fact, Paul recognized the good of the Philippians' material resources, their money, and how they used it generously and for the glory of God. Verse 14, he says, It was kind of you to share my trouble. He doesn't say, I'm going to go ahead and re- return that gift because, you know, money is nothing and you know, I'll just find something to eat. No, he accepts the gift and says, It was kind of you. The Philippians' generosity was a good thing. Their tangible support of Paul was a blessing. Keep in mind that prisons back then were not taxpayer funded, that if you ended up in prison, it was on your family and your friends to take care of you in prison. And perhaps Paul had reached a point of great hunger and great need. And when Epaphroditus arrived with that financial gift from Philippi, no wonder he rejoiced in verse 10. He needed that money. He needed that food. Contentment does not mean detachment from people or detachment from resources. In fact, there are a few other misconceptions about contentment that I think are important to clear up. Contentment does not mean laziness. Contentment does not mean laziness. Perhaps you're listening to this talk on contentment and you're thinking, well, I've got some ambitions. I've got some desires to to advance in my life, in my career. Is that wrong? Is it wrong to work so hard at my job that perhaps I would even be in a position to ask for a raise? No, that's not wrong at all, as long as your motive is for the glory of the Lord and to be a good steward of those things. Look at Paul's life. He was a hard worker. He was an initiator. But contentment is this. As you exert effort, your heart must choose in advance to be content with whatever God chooses to do through those efforts. 
Because perhaps you're not only working hard, but you have some very specific dreams of what that hard work will culminate in. And that's when crushing disappointment comes. Work hard, advance in life, but be content with the Lord's providential leading. But contentment is not laziness. Contentment is not a passive state. In fact, there there are certain things that we should have a holy discontentment with. There are states of our heart and life that are out of line with God's will. And if that is the case, we should have a holy discontentment with that. If you are addicted to a pattern of sin in your life, you should have a discontentment with that and go to the Lord for his strength in a better, for a better path. If there is unresolved conflict in your life and you have not attempted reconciliation, there should be a holy discontent in your heart until you take steps toward that. If there is injustice taking place in the world around you or in your immediate context and there is something you can do to address it, you should have a holy discontentment until you have moved toward seeking justice. If you are not using the spiritual gifts that the Lord has given you to be a steward of, to bless those around you and bring glory to the Lord, you should have a holy discontentment until you move toward service. If you are stagnant in your walk with Christ, if your heart has grown cold to the things of the Lord, you should have a holy discontentment. This was the heart of Paul in chapter 3, verse 12. He said, I haven't already obtained perfection, but I press on to make it my own. Contentment is not detachment. It is not laziness. It is not passivity. But contentment is this. As we passionately pursue growth in Christ and obedience of the Lord, we trust the Lord with the circumstances that he chooses to place us in. He is sovereign and he is good. Again, I quote Thomas Watson. He writes, think often to yourself, my place here, whether I am in a higher or lower state, is not chance or fortune as the blind pagans imagined. No, it is the wise God in his providence who has fixed me in this sphere. We must act out the scene which God chose for us. Perhaps you are in a setting, perhaps you are in a situation that you would not have chosen for yourself. As you are in that place, my friend, contentment looks like bowing before the sovereign will of the Lord as he strengthens you to do so. Knowing that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he demonstrated this once and for all on the cross. He is faithful to you. But as we said last week, it really comes down to this. Do I trust my heavenly Father? He is kind. He is good. He is strong. He is faithful. Do I trust him? This is the secret of contentment. There are a few specific areas that I would encourage you, church family, to be content in as you draw from the strength of Christ. And for perhaps some of these things that I mention would touch your heart and life in such a way that you would take time today to go to the Lord and to pray for his strength to be content in this area. I want to encourage you, Christian friends, to be content with your God-given identity. The way that God has chosen to design you as a human being in his image. Be content with your God-given 
identity. If he has made you to be a man and has provided objective indicators in your body that that is the case, be content in this and ask the Lord for his strength to be the man of God that he calls you to be. If God has chosen for you to be a woman and has embedded within your body objective indicators of that, be content in that, my friend. And ask the Lord for his strength to be the woman of God that he calls you to be. Be content in the color of your skin. Be content in the background that you come from, in the situation that you were born into. Be content in the personality and the gifting that God has given to you. You say, well, I wish I was more outgoing like that person. I wish I was more of a social butterfly like that person. Be content in the personality that the Lord has given to you and steward your personality for the glory of God. We need strength from the Lord. For contentment. Ask him for it. Be content, my friends, in your opportunities, in your status, in your progress through life. Again, it is a good and godly thing to work hard, but have a heart of contentment along the way. Wait on the Lord as you work for the Lord. Pray that the Lord will give you strength to remain in the place that he has you until he moves you. Be content, my friends, in your singleness or in your marriage. Single Christians, as you wait on the Lord for his provision, and I know it is difficult, but my single friends, do not compromise your convictions as you wait on the Lord's provision. Seek the Lord and seek his strength. Spouses, be content in your marriage. Do not seek the kind of intimacy, physical or otherwise, the kind of intimacy in somebody else that should be found in your spouse alone. Say, Pastor Mike, you don't understand. Our marriage is in such a rut. Things have just grown so cold between us. My friend, by the strength of the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit, rekindle that relationship with the spouse that the Lord has graciously provided for you. Be content. Be content in your finances and with your possessions. This is a difficult one, especially as we live in such a materialistic culture, constantly being inundated with advertisements telling us that we should not be content with what we have. But if you were just to purchase this one more thing with four easy payments, just one more thing will make your life complete. Resist this continual influence toward discontentment with what you already have. I know this is not easy. Every time I pass by a bookstore, I must draw from strength from the Lord to resist just a few more books for my library. And the Lord reminds me, you don't even have space on your bookshelf. You still have a lot of books that you bought last month that you haven't read yet. Be content. We need strength from the Lord for this, don't we? And, and here's the thing, my friends. I have no idea what the future holds. But if our economy is affected in some significant way and our economy goes south in a severe way, the people who will be in the best position to navigate this are those who have learned contentment. Be content, my friends, even in trials, even in deep valleys of suffering, and loss. Be content remembering what James 1 teaches, that the testing of your faith produces endurance and Christian maturity, that through that trial, the Lord is producing something good in the big picture. Again, I quote Thomas Watson, who wrote about this. He said, sickness is God's furnace to refine his gold and to make it sparkle even more. The prison can be a house of prayer, 
What if God melts away my possessions from me? Well, perhaps he saw my heart grew too much in love with them. Had I been too long in that fat pasture, I should have overindulged. The better my estate would have been, the worse my soul would have been. God is wise. He allows these trials either to prevent some sin or to exercise some grace. Many of you know our brother, Joe Taylor, and uh, if you know Joe well, you know that he is not only the director of our biblical soul care ministry, but he is also a very talented woodworker. Uh, these boxes in the back of the room that we talk about are offering boxes. Joe actually designed those and made those for our church. And he makes some wonderful things out of wood. Not long ago, I was talking with Joe about his craft of woodworking and he explained that, that a lot of woodworking has to do not only with the cutting and the, the piecing together that you do, but with selecting beautiful wood. If you start with good-looking wood, that puts you on a, a long way down the road of a good overall design. But he said, you know something about, about the wood that is selected for these projects? You see sometimes in wood some, some natural patterns in that wood, dark patterns that are formed within that wood that contribute toward a beautiful piece. He said, you know how those those dark, beautiful patterns within that wood are formed? He said bugs form those dark patterns. Mold forms those dark patterns. Things that we would think of as negative and even destructive. Bugs and mold are what ultimately create those patterns that contribute to a beautiful overall design through the skill of the craftsman. My friends, God is using even the dark patterns in your life, the dark moments, the deep valleys when you struggle to rejoice, when anxiety arises once again in your life, when you find it so very difficult to be content in your circumstance because there is something dark and difficult eating its way through your life. Our God is a master craftsman who can take those dark patterns and have it contribute to a beautiful overall design. Trust him, my friends, even in trials. This is what the contented heart has learned, that even as I go through those valleys, the Lord loves me and he will give me the strength that I need, the peace that I need, the joy that only he can provide. When peace like a river attendeth my way, or when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, in any and every circumstance, you have taught me to know it is well, it is well with my soul.